I am Dr. Sean McFate, and I am a professor of war. The Peloponnesian War remains a classic case study of strategy. It was fought in ancient Greece between Athens and Sparta, the two most powerful city-states in Greece at the time. Their struggles and strategic dilemmas have much to teach us today and demonstrate the enduring nature of war. But before we begin, first, a word about using case studies. Case studies are not history lessons. We are not approaching this as a historian. We are approaching this as students of strategy. And the reason we do this is that these provide miniature labs, sort of like sandboxes to play in, to apply strategic concepts and hone and develop your own skills and strategic IQ. However, there are problems. Done poorly, they risk cherry-picking history to prove theories that are in search of fact, that they open the door to biases, the types of biases that we open the course with a, di a discussion about these biases, like selection bias, confirmation bias, false attribution bias, anchoring bias. All these get in the way. All these are enemies of strategic thought. And also causation versus correlation problems, reductionary analysis, mirroring. Again, these are the enemies of strategic thinking. These are the enemies of critical thinking. Done poorly, in a lazy manner, case studies further those problems rather than resolve them. I will do my best as a Sherpa here to guide you into the pro column and not the con. Now, there are important lessons about lessons, too. Thucydides, who was writing this like 2,300 years ago, was writing it for you. And the reason he, he actually tells us this in the beginning is that people are inclined to accept the first story they hear, first impressions, what we call anchoring bias. And he set out to write down the record as he saw it that was denuded of such biases, and so that others much later on, for you specifically, could understand this war in a clear and analytical light. This is also Klaus Fitz's project. He said, remember that those people who never rise above the antidote, and we see this today in war colleges and security studies programs of retired military officers essentially telling war stories for grad credit. They never actually get down to the general factors that govern the matter. And that's what Thucydides is trying to do. And I hope you see a theme and thread in this course now between who I've selected as theorists and as case studies to help you as, as strategists of the future hone your skills that get down to the general factors that govern matters. Now, the Peloponnesian War was fought between 431 to 404 BCE. BCE is just a scholarly way of saying BC. It means before common era. It, it's, a, it's a sort of a secular version of before Christ because not every scholar is a Christian. So that's standard in scholarship. This war lasted 27 years, and it was a total war. Just like World War I and World War II were total wars for Europe and the other actors around the world, the Peloponnesian War was a total war for the Greek world, the ancient Greek world. It was a death match interspersed with periods of war and peace. Now, why do we start off with this war? Well, not only is it just a classic case study, is that it has multiple good examples of ends, ways, means, mismatches that result in strategic failure. And I'm trying to keep this at the strategic level of war. So again, you can win every battle but lose the war. You can have tactical and operational art dominance, but strategically you can be outwitted and outmatched. And we're going to look at ends, ways, means at the strategic level. It also shows that you know the lack of critical thinking can lead to bad threat assessment, and bad threat assessment almost inevitably leads to bad strategy, unless you're lucky. 
Also, it shows that the failure to understand the nature of war will get the best of you. It shows how multiple sides, not just Athens and Sparta, try different types of strategic adaptation and surprise, and how intelligence surprise is also a big part of this story. It's important here to identify the culminating point of victory and defeat, and we will identify that in this uh, case study, and the significance of allies as centers of gravity. Before we embark on this case study, though, a first, a few caveats. This case study is taught at every almost every war college and almost every security studies program in the English-speaking world. And for some good reasons, it has much to reveal to us. But it's not perfect, and it's certainly not as perfect as the strategic thought canon would have you believe. So in sort of transparency here, I want to reveal a few things for you to think about as you take this, this career study on. First, most of what we know about this war comes from one man, one eyewitness, Thucydides, an Athenian. He is seen as a good historian, perhaps the first. Uh, arguably, Herodotus, the generation before him, was the first, but many point to him as the first true historian, meaning that he doesn't ascribe human phenomenon to the will of the gods, but actually looks at events on the ground and to what people decide and what happens around those people. But as an, you know, and as an eyewitness, he is authoritative. But is this still bad history? One primary source. First, the book was never actually brought to completion. It is a thought that he died while writing the book, as if it stopped mid-sentence, and it became notably less readable towards the end. However, despite you know compiling such a vast amount of knowledge in one book, Thucydides is also thought to be a biased Greek author towards the Athenians. When sourcing, oftentimes he gives only one person, and usually he doesn't cite who they are, uh, or we don't know exactly who they are. This makes it seem sometimes like he is trying to persuade the reader to a certain belief about the war, which would make sense from a military standpoint at the time. For example, is he too soft on Pericles, his old mentor? We will never know because there's no other eyewitnesses to contest him. There's no Spartan version of Thucydides or a Persian version of Thucydides. So all we have to go on is Thucydides. And though he is very good, he, is, he also does have limitations. And this is an, a note for aspiring scholars and practical policymakers, too. You should always be skeptical when anybody presents you just one unchallengeable single source or interpretation. Second, a handful of scholars dominate this field. Good as they are, the topic has become a bit claustrophobic. As you know, in scholarship, there's a system for publication called peer review. The idea of peer review is that your peers ju uh, judge your work, whether it should be you know, published or not, on the notion that you can fool your superiors, you can fool your inferiors, but you can never fool your peers. Now, as rigorous as peer review it is, it also has another dark side. And the dark side is that it breeds groupthink. So if you're an aspiring young scholar of the Peloponnesian War and you want to get tenure or you want to publish a peer-reviewed book, you have to bend the knee and kiss the ring, which means you can't really challenge the gray beards in the, f in the field because they will reject you because they don't really like having their opinions and their basically their, their position in the field chipped away at by young bucks. So... As a result, there is, you know, sort of this, um, this, this bias to kiss the ring, and this creates <clears throat> sort of a claustrophobic feeling about the scholarship now around the Peloponnesian War. It's kind of 
a little wooden and some would say dead. I recommend as an alternative a new book that just came out by Andrew Novo and Jay Parker called Restoring Thucydides. It's a fresh look and they're not really bending knees. Third, histories have their own history. The Peloponnesian War has become the case study in American war colleges and many English-speaking security studies programs around the world in the second half of the Cold War. It's glorified the way CLOSFITS is, and this risks much. Some background. In the early 1970s, the innovative Admiral, U.S. Navy Admiral Stantafield Turner took over the U.S. Navy War College, and he wanted to move thinking away from Vietnam and refocus on the, quote, big war, what we call today great power competition. In his day, it was specifically the USA versus the USSR. He and others liked the Peloponnesian War because it supposedly paralleled the Cold War. U.S. was Athens, a sea power democracy standing up to USSR, which was Sparta, an oligarchy land power, in a bipolar system that somehow reveals the immutable laws of great power conflict. But this manipulation of history is dangerously misleading. Remember earlier how I said sometimes lazy or disingenuous scholars cherry pick history to support Arguably, they're broken down theories. This too is a facile analogy. Athens was not that much of a democracy as people pretended, and Sparta was not a tyrannical oligarchy either, as often portrayed, and the analogies break down from there. However, this case study does have something to offer. It is also part of America's strategic imagination, part of the Department of Defense's strategic lexicon, and as such, we should learn it, and you should learn it critically. So who was Thucydides, our primary source? Note, in the ancient Greek and Latin word, world, there are no soft seas. That was a later bastardization of the tongue by medieval French speakers and scholars. There were no, there were only hard seas in ancient Greece and in ancient Latin. So, for example, it wouldn't, it would like K, so it wouldn't be Thucydides, it would be Thucydides. Same for Latin, it wouldn't be Cicero, it would be Cicero. However, I will stick to modern convention and call him Thucydides. Thucydides was an Athenian, the son of Aloris. Is he comes from a he is without doubt the substantial source we have on the history of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, he is almost synonymous with the struggle, but who was he? Well, he was a member of the Athenian elite whose family owned gold mining concessions in the north. Just like many of today's elites, he was born into wealth, privilege, and connections. Athens, being a democracy, annually elected generals called strategos. The plural is strategoi. This is the root of the word for strategy. He was elected general in 424 BC during the Peloponnesian War, but then was fired and exiled for failing to defend his post when it came under Spartan attack. This obviously is contested by himself too, and we'll talk about issues of democracy in war. In exile outside of Athens, that is where he wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War, and we're th thankful he did. It's not what he sought to do earlier in his life. He was ambitious. In this way, he's a little bit like Machiavelli. Machiavelli only wrote The Prince um, when he was stuck in exile and didn't have anything else better to do. It's not his first choice. He probably died a bitter man. He wanted to be in charge of Florence. I think Thucydides wanted to be like Pericles, his mentor, a great general, a great statesman, a great leader of Athens, and not a shamed exile. But in his exile, he gave us the Peloponnesian War, the book, sometimes just called the History in Antiquity. 
So, like Herodotus, a generation before him, Thucydides has been dubbed a father of, quote, scientific history, or evidence-based history. And he talks about this up front. As he outlines in the introduction to his work, he tries to observe strict standards of evidence gathering and analysis in terms of cause and effect without reference to intervention by gods as poets and dramatists did at his time. His book was successful, and although he did not live to complete it, it remains an important part of the classical canon and is widely read throughout integrity. And he tells you what his purpose is up front. It wasn't done to curry local favor at the time. He was writing it for you. He was writing it for today. It's sort of like a ghost from the past, telling us what happened so that future generations knew what happened there. So why has he always been read? And even during the purges of books and the burning of the Alexandria Library by both Christians and Muslims alike, and through the purge of intellectual knowledge done by the Christian church in the medieval era, Thucydides has always been read. He somehow always survived. Some of this may be luck, but other people, there's other reasons too. His account gives us a vivid picture of political ambition, clashing strategies, malleable alliance, and the degeneration of societies in war. It presents moral arguments, but is not moralizing. It it represents painful events without revealing the pain caused to the author as he recounts the destruction of his civilization through internecine conflict and foreign intervention. It offers us some important insights into big questions about why nations fight and how they fight. It explores how states make decisions and calculate national interests. It offers us insight into human nature and the frailty of civilization itself. Thucydides wanted his book to be a possession for all time, and thus far, he has succeeded. Such heady praise places a heavy burden on Thucydides and also on those who read him. Today, we know him as a historian with quotable gems. Like, for example, like all democracies, now that they were terrified, they were ready to put everything in order. Such as, you know, when again, he describes uh, a change of policy in Athens, uh, or he also has schools of thought named after him, fairly or not. He is a father of political realism, which is a pragmatic school of thought in international relations. It views foreign affairs and as, you know, relations between states as based on might rather than right. Morality need not apply. There is only victory and defeat and the living and the dead. Again, Catilia, Machiavelli, Hobbes. Not by coincidence, in fact. Thomas Hobbes was the first to translate Thucydides into English in 1628. Hobbes was another famous, quote, father of realism with his seminal text, The Leviathan. Many of you have no doubt read it. If not, you should. It's written in magnificent Tudor English. Thucydides' classical text is still studied at advanced military schools, security studies worldwide. Uh, It is also abused, just like Clausewitz is abused, perhaps the true signifier of fame. For example, Graham Allison's book, or infamous book, The Thucydides Trap argues that somehow the U.S. and China are destined for war based on Thucydides. Though a bestseller, it made both ancient Greek scholars and modern Chinese experts taste vomit in their mouths. Perhaps his most famous one-line legacy today is the Melian Dialogue. It's the realist's anthem. Many of you can recite it in your sleep. The strong will do what they will. The weak suffer what they must. Realism is a utopia-free zone, and we will discuss the context of the Melian Dialogue in this case. So let's talk, before we get to the war, what led to the war? All wars have a beginning, and it's never when the first bullet or the first spear is thrown. This 
is the ancient Greek world. It's a lot older and bigger than most realize. Socrates famously said, we sit like frogs around a pond, and that pond being the Mediterranean. It dates back to the Bronze Age, at least 12th century BCE. This is what Sparta and Athens fought for, to become hegemon of this world, not for absolute control, but for influence over this ancient Greek world. There are no states in the ancient Greek world, only city city states called a polis, or plural, poles. Many started as colonies of powerful city states like Sparta or Athens, but became independent of their parent polis. polis. Blood tithes were kept as an affiliation, um, but this was not; these were not colonies, say, like the way France held Indochina or Britain held India. Think of uh, these polices or poles as offspring. They, they have blood ties to their parent, but they were independent too. Note where the where the density of policies or polis I will I will interchange those words to soon all policies which is not actually correct um the, the, it's in the Aegean which is the home to ancient Greece and also to Sicily Sicily will become later important in this war but you can see they go as far as Odessa to Marseille these started as ancient Greek policies Thucydides begins his story where Herodotus, the you could say, was the father of history before him left off. The first Persian War. So this is important background because Persia is like it is a superpower of the ancient world, especially in this time. In fact, Persia was a superpower from all the way from ancient Greece through the entire thousand year Roman Republic Empire into the Muslim era. I mean, ancient Persia was a force to behold, and it was at a strength at this time. So in 490 BCE, the Persian Empire, having conquered most everything to their east, all the way into what we call India, turned its eyes on the west. The scrappy bit of rocks in the Aegean and today what we think of as southeast Europe. The ruler of the day was called King Darius the Great, also known as the, quote, King of Kings a title Christians would later adopt for Jesus Christ, uh, or Yeshua Christos, because, his, because Darius' empire was so vast, he was the king of kings. Many poles joined forces to rebel against the Persian invaders. Many of them were overtaken, particularly on the coastline of what we think of Western Turkey, then called the Ionian coast, full of Greek polis. And they, uh, in many ways, uh, but, but they, they banded together on the mainland of Greece today to fight him. Incredibly, the plucky little Athenians stopped Persia in a surprise upset, the Battle of Marathon. Greece's champion heavyweight Sparta was delayed from going to the battlefield to fight and join the Athenians uh, owing to a religious festival. And just for some background, Sparta had long been considered the heavyweight champion of the ancient Greek world. And the ancient Greek world is a little bit like Afghanistan today. They bickered and fought amongst themselves to no end. But when a foreign invader came, they all banded together. They were all Hellens or Greeks. Uh, and as soon as that, um, you know, the foreign invader left, they sort of resided with their normal bickering. So this was an exceptional event of Sparta working with Athens, working with other for you know other policies like Corinth to unite to push back a foreign enemy invader. And everybody assumed that Athens would get wiped out because they were not known as a land power, they were known as a sea power, but they destroyed in a decisive battle um, the Persians. And this was the beginning of Athens' rise to power. Now, the, the second there's a second Persian War about 10 years later. Darius's son Xerxes 
uh, swore revenge on the Greeks. And how dare these scrappy little hungry Greeks, you know, push back a superpower. I'm going to go in there and take revenge and I will conquer them and show them who is who. So Xerxes launches, 11 years later, another massive invasion against Greece. Uh, and again, the Greeks unite. They stop their bickering. They unite. Um, and as the and here we have the army and the Persian navy going, you know, in parallel. And as Xerxes' fleet sails around and takes at to take Athens, the Persians suffer another major setback at the famed Thermopylae Pass or the Hot Gates. This is where 300 Spartans held off the entire Persian army for three days buying precious time. And they did it in this very narrow pass. Perhaps the most famous battle in history. Um, certainly one of the most famous battles in history, if not antiquity. Um, meanwhile, Xerxes' fleet continues to sail around to take Athens. And it suffers another similar major upset. A smaller Athenian navy scores a decisive defeat at the Battle of Salamis Bay outside of Athens. The fighting continued for another year until the Persians left after the defeat of Plataea, which was here. Fed up and frustrated in their attempt of conquest, they, they, re they retreat. And you can read more about this in Herodotus. Or you can watch the movie 300. Just kidding. This is violence porn, not a documentary. Just so you know, this is what Thermopylae looked then and now. To the left is an uh, artist's depiction, and you can see like the huge columns of the Persian army being held up by 300 Spartans. Now, if you look at it today, that see where that road is? That That's sort of the ancient highway. It's still there. You can see the terrain features in the back. But where's the ocean? Where's the sea? Well, over the eons, it was taken over by sediment, and now it's it's actually dirt. You know, there's highways on it, Autostrada, oh, not Autostrada, there's highways on it. Um, so that's what it looks like now, but you can still see the ancient road, it's still there. And it's a great story. For those who are unfamiliar with Thermopylae, you should uh, look into it. It's, a, it's an amazing feat of bravery. So after this war ends, which is her, where Herodotus ends and where um, Thucydides, you know, picks up. We have the 50 years of peace between 479 and 435. This is also called the, um, forgive my Greek here, the Pentacontatia. And um, it is a period where the Greeks are very nervous about a third invasion of the Persians. Because the Persians are a superpower and they are good and the Greeks are good and lucky and they want to be prepared for this. And so this is where Thucydides begins uh, because it's also the beginning of a growing Cold War between Sparta, the reigning Greek power or polis, and Athens, the rising one. Now, fearing another Persian invasion and an act of deterrence, many Greek polices formed a collective security alliance similar to NATO called the Delian League. It was started in the winter of 478, 477, and by 450, it had more than 300 independent polices or members uh, with Athens as its de facto leader. In theory, all were equal, but in practice, Athens dominated, first among equals. The Delian League's uh, polices paid tribute annually, uh, either as tr with troops or with money. And over time, the Delian League amassed a fortune, uh, and its treasury was stored on the small island of Delos. Here, hence the name Delian League. So Delos was seen as a small backwatered, central, isolated, neutral country or neutral place, the way Switzerland is. Um, meanwhile, Sparta did something different. They did not participate in the Delian League. They, had, they dominated an older league called the Peloponnesian League. This peninsula here, um, that is called the Peloponnesus. 
And this is also the name of the title, the Peloponnesian War. So the Peloponnesus, these powers are much older Greek powers like Sparta, Corinth, Argos. And they were, they, they had a better military, as they had, you know, they, they had been around. They were sort of earlier hegemonic powers in the Greek world. And they had, a, um, they had like a sort of a, a very kind of loose confederacy. It was an alliance, but it wasn't, it wasn't strong and organized the way that the Athenians organized the Delian League, the way that NATO's organized. This was just more of a sort of a general pact. It, it um, uh, just sort of a, a, it's a loose alliance. It's not an active one. And there's lots of our own alliance theory, which you can read in Steve Waltz and others. Um, alliances, but the, here the allies were obliged to follow Sparta wherever it led. But it, there's a lot of kickback to that, too, as we saw from, like, Corinth. Um, so it was more of a, uh, it wasn't really a, a confederation. It was more of an organized alliance. It was kind of looser. Um, and, and that's, again, because it had been around a long time. The policies there were fairly mature, fairly resourced. And they didn't, they thought of Sparta as the, the, the de facto leader, but they also were pretty independent in their own thinking. Finally, there were um, other, that's, so they created the Peloponnesian League from the 6th century, dominated by Sparta. Uh, and there were other small powers that were essentially Spartan satellites with no rule of autonomy. During this time, Sparta was seen as the raging, the reigning hegemon, and raging to some extent too. So as Athens grew in wealth and power, it did something that alarmed everybody in the ancient Greek world. It moved, some might say stole, the Delian League's very plump treasury and moved it from Delos to Athens, alarming, again, much of the Greek world. It marked three things. The transition from a Greek alliance to an Athenian empire, the rise of Athens as a hegemonic rival to Spartan, challenging the reigning superpower, and the beginning, really, Here's the real beginning of, the, of, a, of a cold war between Sparta and Athens that would eventually lead to a hot war 25 years later. And the reason I say it marked a transition from Greek alliance to Athenian empire is that a lot of these other policies around the Delian League were not happy with it. But using sort of, you know, a Athens using a Machiavellian logic, Catilian logic, they did it because they could. And the Delian League couldn't do much else about it. And the Peloponnesian League couldn't be bothered with it. So what caused the war? The, the, you know, there's, we should have a whole course on the origins of war, right? Well, Thucydides names five reasons, but essentially he said it comes down to this. The growth of the power of Athens and the alarm that this inspired in Lacedaemon, which was Sparta, another word for Sparta, made war inevitable. And this has long been called the Thucydides trap. It's not a term invented by Graham Allison, but it's essentially this idea that, you know, reigning powers and rising ones inevitably have to go to war. There's no peaceful rise of reigning powers. Um, and we see a lot of this in things in IR theory, like offensive, offensive realism, uh, school by Mearsheimer, uh, power transition politics. Uh, this is not a new idea. It's not, it's not a new term. Again, um, it's become made famous because of Graham Allison, which is fine, but he really kind of to be honest, is a hack. Um, I will probably regret saying that someday. He was my former advisor at Harvard. But, it, you know, there are, he's not the first. Uh, many people have said this before. Uh, on a side issue, n notable scholars of the Peloponnesian War, like Donald Kagan, argue that the war was not, in fact, inevitable. That at multiple points, Sparta and Athens, their leadership could have slowed down the train. That they, they had other opportunities, other courses of action to choose. They made decisions. Uh, just like in World War I, you know, the shooting of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo in 1940, 1914, May not does not inevitably lead to war the way that some scholars pretend. Leaders have decisions and power that they can make. They have some autonomy here. Uh, it's not just pure structure. There's agency as well. So this idea that 
that reigning powers and rising ones inevitably go to war, I would ask you to think about that and question that. Are there counterexamples for that? Does the Thucydides trap even exist? Because even careful scholars of Thucydides say, no, actually both pirates had multiple opportunities to, to veer off the road and take a, a, a highway exit off in the off ramp. I'll leave that for you to ponder. Okay, now we have to talk about the geopolitics at the start of the war, all right? So we're setting the scene here. 431 BCE, Sparta and Athens are at a, a pretty frosty cold war. Um, they have been at the brink of war before. There actually is some conflict between them earlier, it's called, sometimes called the First Peloponnesian War, um, but they sort of managed the conflicts back to peace. It wasn't, didn't, they didn't go to a total war. So here we go. So he, first of all, this is the ancient Greek world that we're going to focus on. Red, here's Athens, and the red, the red uh, policies, that is the Delian League. Remember, it's not so much a league as arguably an Athenian empire because they get to call the shots. They get to call it. So they're in on paper, they're free to come and go. But in practice, um, Athens is leaning on them. Now, opposing is Sparta on the Peloponnese and the Peloponnese League. And that's mostly on the Peloponnese Peninsula itself. And there's some to the north as well, as you see. Um, then there are neutral Greek states. There are four important neutral Greek states. There's Argus, which is on the Peloponnese itself. It was it and Sparta have a testy relationship because before Sparta became the hegemon, it was Argos who was the hegemon. And then Sparta and Argos fought over the centuries prior and Sparta emerged on top. So Argos is still not to be trifled with. And they're like, you know, you think you're the leader, but you're not the leader of us. There's Melos, the small island to your right, hence the Melian dialogue. We'll get back to them. They're kind of strong enough and out of, way, out of the way enough that they can sort of escape the both the Athenian and the Spartan uh, shadow. Then we have Corfu up in the, the middle left here. Right now it's marked in red. The reason it's marked in red and not gray as a neutral is because they, they, the, the war starts there and they instantly flip to Athens. But at this moment, um, they are neutral. And then to the left in Sicily is Syracuse. Remember earlier that there's a lot of Greeks on Sicily. And those in Syracuse, they were sort of, um, shall we say, offspring of Sparta and Corinth. Corinth is also in the Peloponnesian League. And they've got blood ties. Um, but the tyrants of Syracuse, and that's what their title were, ty tyrants, um, were they, they set in a lot of resources, wood, um, timber, uh, grain, wealth, mines. And right now they are kind of out of, they are out of it. Uh, out of the war, uh, but later on they will not be. And then lastly, there is Persia. Okay, also, before we get that, there are barbarians. Now, barbarians, as you see here, they are in the green, and the word barbarian actually comes from the Greeks at this time. It's what they mockingly called non-Hellenic or non-Greeks. So all these policies, even though they fought internecine wars, they all spoke Greek. They all they were all from generally the same culture. They ate similar food. They believed in the same gods. Um, so they were sort of, um, you know, they were a rambunctious family, if you will. But they also recognize that there are people who are not Greeks, whether they be, uh, you know, the Etruscans in Italy or the Persians um, there. And they consider them to be lower than Greeks and to be uncivilized, uncultured. And they mockingly call them barbarians. Why do they call them barbarians? Because that's what their language sounded like to the ancient Greek. Bar, 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 bar. And that name has stuck through the era. So there are barbarians uh, around who don't really get involved in this fight. And then there's the Persian Empire. Now, Persia tried to invade and take over the Greek world twice in, in big gambles, and they lost. But they have not lost their ambition, and they're waiting in the wings. And we'll see what that looks like later on. Now, the actual triggering event for the war takes place 
in Kosaira, which is this island up here, what today we call Corfu. And the war almost starts by accident. It's actually triggered by a triggering event. So what it was a triggering event in conflict studies, it's imagine this, you have a the Cold War between Sparta and Athens is like a big, gigantic pile of lumber that is dry and soaked in kerosene. The triggering event is somebody who comes along with a lit match and lights it on fire. A classic triggering event is the assassination of you know Archduke Ferdinand um, of the Habsburg Empire in 1914 in Sarajevo that you know unravels into World War One. Something similar happens here in Corfu. And here's the brief TikTok of events. Kosaira is a powerful neutral. So remember, there are big neutral here. Uh, it's shown here in red, but at the time it was gray. Uh, it's an island city-state, and it possessed one of the biggest fleets of the Greek world. Why is that important? See all those islands. Um, in some ways, naval power was more important than sea power in the ancient Greek world. Debatable, but something to debate. Now, Corinth down here, again, part of the Peloponnesian League, but a, really a great power of itself. Too often we think of it's Athens versus Sparta, but you can make a compelling case that it wasn't a bipolar system. It was a multipolar system with Corinth as one of the poles. So, so Corinth builds actually a bigger fleet, and this alarms uh, Corsera. Uh, because Corinth is already has, it is one of the most powerful polices, uh, second only to Athens and Sparta, and it also is part of the Peloponnesian uh, League allied to Sparta. So it's got friends in its corner. And this prompts Corsaira to make an alliance with Athens, which also has a big fleet. So this is like the security dilemma unfolding before your eyes. So they make a defensive, Athens and Kosara make a defensive act uh, for deterrence reasons. So if you attack Kosara, it's like attacking Athens. Athens will send its large fleet to double up with Kosara's large fleet, and that should put Corinth back in its box. That's the strategic logic of, of, the, de of the deterrence pact. Um, but this, of course, alarms Corinth uh, because it upsets the delicate balance of power between Athens and Sparta. So perhaps in preventative war, and preventative war is always a dubious concept, a controversial concept. Um, it was used, for example, in Iraq of 2003, not to be mixed up with preemptive war. Preemptive war is more like a spoiling attack. Pre preventative war is that someday we believe we're going to go, we're going to go to war with somebody else, this you know person X, and we're at the moment stronger than person X. So let's get it done and not wait till person X gets even stronger. So that's the logic behind preventative war. It has lots of problems, as you can probably no doubt figure out. Um, so perhaps for preventive war, Corinth sails to conquer Corsaira, betting that Athens will not go to war against Sparta over it. Because remember, Corinth is also aligned to Sparta. Now there is a battle, a uh, Sabota, and this is where Corinth is about to smite Corsaira. <laughs> However, a small contingent of Athenian ships gets in the way, it's sort of like peacekeepers. They sail out in the middle of it, and um, Corinth does not want to sink Athenian ships because that would be overreach. And so Corinth's victory, or Corinth has a victory, but it's not decisive. And this pisses off Corinth greatly. Um, Corinth goes back to Flo to Sparta and appeals to the Peloponnesian League. You know, Peloponnesian League activate to stand up to Athenian aggression. And remember, this is not the first time that Athens, you know, was you know meddling in the affairs of the Peloponnesian League. Uh, from their point of view, there's 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 fifty years of malcontent between of bad blood between Sparta and Athens. So there there was you know this this was not. <clears throat> seen as okay it's a misunderstanding this was seen those devilish athenians are just you know always chomping in the bit to to be a rising power and so <clears throat> the sparta the spartan assembly declares that athens broke the peace and essentially declared and they then declared war against athens and the reason their 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 great reason was freedom 
for the Greeks. Freedom for all Greeks. Because remember, many in the Greek world viewed Athens as being a belliger a belligerent, aggressive, rising, and pushy power that had sort of hijacked the Delian League, was acting like an imperial force, and then this sort of mission creep of imperialism uh, was ongoing for decades, and Corsairo is just sort of the, uh, the latest event in this trend. And they said, it's not, we're doing it not just for um, you know, for Corinth, we're doing it for all Greeks. Somebody has to put the Athenians back in their box. This is what launches the Peloponnesian War. That's where the battle was. So, to war. To war. So here we go. Now, the two most powerful city-states in, in that system, in that world there... Two different cultures, yes, they spoke, you know, Greek and they ate similar food and they had similar gods, but we'll get into the differences. They were also very different and they, there could only be one, only one victor, sort of. We'll get into that. We'll see who won and why, all right? Um, now, just to begin with, both, and tell me if this sounds familiar, both powers, Sparta and uh, Athens, thought this would be a short and decisive war. How many times in history have we heard this? You know, the outbreak of World War I, all sides thought they would be home by Christmas in 1914, the victor. Um, so many wars have been started thinking it'll be quick and easy. Donald Rumsfeld helped push the war in Iraq in 2003. He assured the world that it'll be done in a few days or weeks at the most, certainly not months is what he predicted and promised in 2003. Uh, arguably, the U.S. is still embattled there 20 years later. So how many wars in history have been started with the false assessment that this will be a very quick and very easy war? We don't even have to sweat. So let's look at the two sides. Let's first look at Sparta. Actually, not too impressive, right? But looks can be deceiving. Sparta's strength rested in its society and not its architecture. And this was known in antiquity. Sparta was also known as Lacedaemonia. Uh, it, they, they, they were synonymous. We'll just keep calling them Spartans. Um, and Thucydides tells us that even you know in his day, if you went there, it would be unimpressive. It was probably a kind of a, a, a agrarian rural uh, a big town with wood not with huge temples of stone and marble um, but that you'd be wrong to underestimate it uh, yes it was an agrarian economy with a conservative culture it was a rural society its power traced back to the 7th century bc uh, bce when it conquered the western peloponnese the area of messenia uh, and by the end of the 6th century Spartan had taken over the entire Peloponnese, uh, including Argos, which had been the reigning sort of great power polis at that time. Hence, the the enmity between Argos and Sparta. They never Argos never got over that. They're th like we are still really in charge. Sparta is the upshot, not Athens. Um, so the the Spartans then then ruled as feudal overlords of the of the rest of of Messenia, um, who were reduced to serfs, often called helots. So it's ironic because these helots were like serfs or slaves. Sparta was the only Greek polis to basically enslave other Greeks. Yes, the Greek world had tons of slaves, but they were barbarian slaves. From their point of view, they were second-rate human beings, to be truthful about it. But the Helots were not. The Helots were Greek. They were conquered. They were colonized the way that great European powers colonized uh, other places later on in the, the Age of Empire in the, in, mo in the modern era. And, um, and it's ironic because Sparta was declaring war on Athens for the liberation of all Greeks, yet under their nose were the helots, something that all Greeks knew about. Um, and in fact, not surprisingly, as the historian Xenophon, not to be confused with the, um, the Persian leader Xenophon, Xenophon was a very popular name back then, um, he said that the, the 
the helots would have gladly eaten the Spartans raw. There was so much hatred towards the Spartan, their Spartan overlords. And, you know, to keep the helots in line, Sparta developed in part into a, um, a very well-equipped army security force uh, to dominate its neighboring city-states and to 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 basically rule as overlords. So they became sort of a military feudalistic society with them at the top where they hone the skills of combat and organization and the helots work like serfs to provide the food and to provide wares and so forth. So it's sort of medieval that way. And their warrior ethos in itself becomes the, a, a symbol of strength, and not just a symbol, but an actual source of strength. Their culture was formidable. In fact, modern militaries are still based in large degree on Spartan warrior ethos and Spartan military culture. They inspired the Romans. The Romans inspired, you know, uh, Middle Ages. And uh, and so it goes until to this day, a lot of our military commands can trace their roots back to like, you know, parade rest. You know, it's our, they, they trace themselves back to Rome and back to Sparta. So it made Sparta strong with its warrior ethos and the skill of its army. Spartan boys around the age of seven would be separated from their parents and would be go into, they would join the army. They would live in barracks and train to be super soldiers, sort of a think of like Ender's Game or something like that. The word Spartan today still exists in the English language to describe their lifestyle 2,500 years later. I mean, how many other words are like that out there? Spartan mothers, although they were grieved to see their sons torn away from the bosom at age seven, um, they also were part of this culture. And they, when the when the boys and the men went off to war, which is the highest honor every Spartan could hope for, a good death. Um, in some in some ways, like a samurai society, there um, they would present the mothers would ritualistically present a shield to their their you know young son the young man's son and say you come back either with this or upon this so you become victorious or you become dead you don't you're not a coward there's no greater sin in spartan society than being a coward um so of the if you remember of the legendary 300 who stood up against the whole Persian army, well, they, that's the way to go out, you know, in a flame of glory. There are only two survivors, both of which were shamed for life because they ran away. They abandoned their post. One was called uh, Aristodemus, the coward. <laughs> he was known as the coward. Um, the next year he, he came back, he redeemed himself against the, the Battle of Plataea, which is the final battle between the Greeks and the Persians, where he broke lines, they broke the, the shield wall and went screaming berserk headlong into the, the Persian onslaught taking down many Persians uh, before he himself was slaughtered. So he broke the Persian phalanx, uh, kicked some Persian butt before being killed as a way to redeem himself from you know, the cowardice stigma. The other survivor was uh, Pantetes. He was a Spartan. They made him wear a half beard on one side of his face. One side was shaved and the other side had a beard. And they, they did this because they didn't know if he was a man or a woman. Later, he hanged himself. It's also to know that um, in ancient, uh, ancient Sparta, unlike many ancient uh, policies that the women had a lot of autonomy. They exercised with the men. They were not just household creatures. They so in some ways you could you could look at the Spartans as being you know backwards and whatnot. You could there's many things to admire in their culture. Both Plato and, and Aristotle admired Spartan culture, admired Sparta greatly, maybe even more than Athens. And the women of Sparta had a, a lot of freedom for their time. Now let's talk about Sparta's regime. This is important because many, remember, the cold warriors will say Sparta was an oligarchy. Well, it really wasn't. 
they did have two kings for life, but they didn't have absolute power, and they had to share power. Um, it, it, you know, they had also this idea of um, a board of e They had five senior elected officials called e um, these e were elected by an assembly of Spartan citizens. They served for one year and could be re-elected, but they were term limited. Uh, the Jerusia was made of a smaller assembly of 28 of Sparta's older citizens. Think of the gray beards. The Jerusia or Gerusia is also the root of our word geriatric. Um, they worked this this small council, well, this council plus the two Spartan kings made up the Gerusia. Um, and the Garontes who, uh, were also elected by the citizen assembly. They had to be over the age of 50 or over the age of 60, excuse me, and they would serve for life, unlike e The assembly itself was composed of all Spartan citizens. Membership was strictly controlled based on property qualifications parentage, the passing through of the Spartan agogi, which is the um, their military training system, so you have to be a vet, and the assembly voted on motions put to it by the Gerousia. So it is not exactly an oligarchy as often portrayed, not really a democracy, but not an oligarchy either. Culturally, Sparta was famous for its modest and conservative values. Some scholars believe Spartan, again, women enjoyed more liberty than women elsewhere in ancient Greece, including Athens. So let's go to Athens now. Wow, pretty cool, right? Athens, on the other hand, was a more robust democracy and a much more robust and thriving city. Um, you know, and as a statesman Pericles argued in his funeral oration, Athens looked like to think of itself as exceptional, the school of Hellas, the school of Greeks, with a political system and society that were models to be imitated rather than, uh, you know, than the imitation of others. But here, Thucydides himself, with Athenian, would say, hey, look, for posterity, speaking to you now, if you look at the remains of Athens, you could be easily duped in thinking it was much more powerful than it was. Um, so don't, you know, don't let looks deceive you. In the golden age of Athens, the period between the Persian Wars and the end of the Peloponnesian War, the city produced the plays of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes, the philosophy of Socrates and Plato, although to be fair, they were not in favor of, of uh, democracy. If you read the Republic, it's not a democratic society. In fact, it looks a little bit more Spartan than Athenian. Um, the temples, the Acropolis, the art, the trade. I mean, there's a lot of modern Western culture that can find its roots in um, ancient Athens. And so did the Roman world, particularly when it comes to philosophy, whether it be Socrates or the school of... Um, uh, um, uh, it'll come back to me later. <laughs> Many philosophical schools came from Athens. And Athens were, that's where universities were. If you were young Cicero or Cicero was educated in Athens because he was a serious Stoic, for example. That's the word I was looking for. Stoicism was the, the main sort of religion slash philosophy of the Roman elites before Christianity took over in 315, 313 AD. So here's a depiction of Athens at the time. Imagine if you're coming, if you're a barbarian and you're coming from the hinterlands of Greece, this would be mighty impressive. And, you know, what built all those temples? Well, some of it was the Delian League's arguably stolen treasury. Uh, also, the Athenians were great traders and they had naval superiority so they can dictate uh, international trade as they saw it. So this is, again, what the Acropolis might have looked like back then. Let's go inside of it. Athena, the Athena Parthenon, she is the goddess of wisdom uh, and of some, uh, some ways might, uh, was built with $45 million worth of gold. And this was literally the final reserve of the Athenian treasury. When things really got bad, they could take this gold down, melt it, and turn it into a fleet. Melt it and turn it into an army. So think again that, you know, centers of gravity, it's a center of gravity wealth, and that these types of, this type of power wealth is fungible. You can turn gold into a fleet. 
you can turn gold into an army. So this is what she wore. She wore uh, Athens, you know, last stand, if you will. And also her her skin was ivory. And as you know, ivory cracks and dries. So they had a guy whose job it was in ancient Athens to every day go up there and buff her skin with water or oil to keep it moist. And he did that every day. It's sort of like um, the painting of the, uh, the, 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 what's the, 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 the big bridge and um, anyway, it'll come back to me too. I'm having memory jog issues here in San Francisco. Um, they paint that thing from start to finish. They start over again the next, the next year. Okay, so let's go to Athenian politics. It is not, it is an, it's a democracy, as you know. Demos means from the people. It's a body of citizens. That's their elected assembly, if you will. And it was notable because in an era of kings and tyrants, they did have a democracy. Um, it, it's not as democratic as we think of it today, but it was very democratic for its era. And we have to judge these things in the historical era that they come from, not in our modern historical judgments and values. It placed power in the hands of the people, the demos, and Thucydides discusses how this impacts the war, strategic decision making, and also what happens to democracy as war goes on. Um, And the lessons we can learn about how democracies fight wars still resound today still resound today in the problem of, say, demagoguery. Uh, and, and, you know, are, you know, it, can you have strategy by committee? Uh, all these come to the forefront in the Peloponnesian War. Athens endured it 24, 2300 years ago. So during the time of, you know, also, also Athens was also an imperial democracy. So she was quite, or he was, the, the, the policy was quite democratic relatively within, but Athens was not terribly democratic with its allies. And so there's a hypocrisy there too, just the way that you had Sparta of the Helots fighting for liberation. You had uh, Athens, the democracy, not treating its allies democratically. So during the time of the Peloponnesian War, the primary power for decision-making rested with the assembly of citizens called the Ecclesia. Later on, Christians would use the Ecclesiastic as the name of the church, the congregation. It comes from the Ecclesia here. Uh, They were adult men who had completed their military service, so they were vets. Others, of course, were famously excluded from Athenian democracy, women, Free men, free slaves, resident foreigners, slaves, they were not uh, members. They could not vote. So it was not a perfect democracy. Um, and it, the, the democracy, and it really um, most of the, it, only about 10 to 20 percent uh, of the eligible men actually were actively engaged in full time politics. And those people were the elites. Because who had the time? If you were like a carpenter or a stonemason or a tradesman or a farmer, who could go walk into Athens and spend the whole day debating, you know, what to do about, you know, Corfu or uh, Corsaira? So it really became, um, you know, only about ten to twenty percent of, of of the population really was actively involved. And um, this this is something to think about. Uh, you know, is it a democracy? Is it ruled by elites? Are democracies much different today? Think about that. It was this, it was the case for Athens at least. Uh, they would meet, uh, you know, uh, a couple times a month um, to discuss and debate issues of national policy. So. Archons were also an important part of Athenian democracy. This was a nine-man committee focused on religious, military, and legal affairs. They were chosen by lot. It was like jury selection. And after a one-year term, they left office to become members of the Vuli. Um, this was a senior assembly that served like much like Spartan Gerosia or Gerosia. They were the gray beards who were there to sort of put the brakes on young ambition and and had the wisdom of experience, etc. Uh, it was composed of ex archons and it could set the agenda for the ecclesia, which is the assembly, and also served as a law court for major criminal cases. So within Athenian democracy, the most important office fulfilled was fulfilled by elections was the strategoi or the generals. 
A slate of 10 generals was elected annually. And unlike archons and other officers, they could be re-elected. So Pericles famously, uh, who was the great sort of Athenian statesman of his era, uh, the age of Pericles, many would say, uh, served as a general in numerous consecutive years, stamping his authority on Athenian pol political scene. And think about that. Is that smart or not smart to have uh, elected generals rather than you know professional generals? So what are the pros and cons of it? There are pros and there are cons. Something to discuss for a section or discussion. So like all democratic systems, ancient and modern, Athens feared tyranny and the concentration of too much power in the hands of any individual or small minority. This again is like, think of Madison's, uh, the Federalist Paper number 10. How do you, uh, you want to protect minorities, but you also don't want them to take over and hijack the, the society at large. So to further to mitigate this threat of a small minority or individual sort of taking over, they invented the institution of ostracism. Now, this took place at the end of every year, and the assembly would, would be asked if they wished to expel any citizen from Rome, any, no matter how powerful, wealthy, rich, uh, you know, whatever, influential. And if the assembly voted yes in sort of a secret ballot, the ostracism vote would, you know, uh, it would take um, the, the, it would take place two months later. Uh, during the vote, citizens would, would present an ostraca. So this is the way it worked is every if, if they decided that you were going to be you could be ostracized two months later, they would have these big jars and at each jar had somebody's name on it. The person who was to be ostracized. So it could be McFate or it could be. Uh, Biden or it could be Trump or whomever, right? To, not to be too political, but that's the context of it. Like nobody was safe, right? Um, and people would who are members, you know, the of the demos of the assembly again, males. They would drop a piece of shard, a shard of sh a broken sh uh, pottery into that big urn, and at the end of the day, they would count who had the most. Um, you know, shards against them. And if you made a threshold, you were ostracized for 10 years. So uh, that meant you were exiled for 10 years. You could not step foot within Athenian ground. Um, and this was the ruin of many people. And in some ways, uh, Thucydides, he was practically exiled. He, he, um, he, he stayed in place where he was relieved of command, but he was in some ways ostracized too. And this meant that nobody was above the law. Nobody was above the law. And um, in some ways, it's like the Oscars of exile. And people would game it just like they do the Oscars today. So if you had a political enemy who was up for ostracization, you might print you might skip, print shards or have pottery making with their name on it and hawk it with free food and free gifts like popcorn or sausages and say, hey, if you vote, if you vote yes for my enemy, here's a free hot dog. So there was all sorts of, you know, carnival-esque uh, festival shrewdness going on at these things. But ostracism was a way to keep the institution honest. And I wonder if what that would look like today. Do you think that's a good idea for dem democracies today, that anybody could be ostracized? Or would that just be, a uh, use another um, ancient Greek idea, opening the Pandora's box or Pandora's jar? Okay, so there were significant differences between Sparta and Athenian alliance systems. Uh, also, which we, we won't cover in this. Um, well, we'll talk a little bit, but they're, culturally they were different. Politically, they were different. The militaries are different. So even though they were Greeks, they had a lot of differences between them. So let's look at their alliance systems. So Pericles was the gray beard in chief of the Athenian democracy. He was a war hero, a masterful politician, an apt general, a good strategist who helped Athens become a great Power. So it's hard to under uh, to overstate his significance in the Athenian political scene, and he was the height of his power at the beginning of this war. And he also knew that a swift, decisive clash of arms between Sparta would be folly because Spartan had the best military in the world, and everybody knew that. Um, so instead, what he hoped to do was something a little sneakier, a little bit more Maoist. He hoped to use um, 
Athens superiority at sea to harass Spartan coastal clients, uh, try to get those helots to revolt. And meanwhile, they would stay, Athens would stay secure behind its large city walls and build up an economic advantage by maintaining its empire and basically frustrate the Spartans into peace. And so their victory basically was, you know, we just want Sparta, we don't want to defeat them, we just want them to acknowledge us as a peer, as a near peer power. And that we are not going away. So we, it's it's a Maoist strategy in some ways, and a Maoist victory. We win by not going away. We force Sparta to acknowledge Athens as an equal. Now here was their assessment of Sparta, and it was I would say fairly accurate. We'll judge how this goes. They knew that hoplites, which were the foot soldiers in ancient Greece, you had some called hoplites, that that Spartan hoplites and tactics and military, it was unbeatable. Nobody could beat them. Uh, and that Athens had a pretty good military, but it really was no match. Um, but that ultimately, you know, Spartans were just farmers uh, who accumulated no wealth, no culture, no, and they could not sustain the war. So they could wage it because they had no wealth and they were agrarian and they were backwards. They had no, they couldn't really sustain it. And this limited them to short campaigns due to a threat of a hell of uprising. So remember, they kind of evolved their militaristic culture to keep the helots productive and subdued. And the helots would eat them raw if they could. So what this meant is that they could practically wage war uh, in like 28 day TDYs, meaning that they would take a you know a week or so to march to Athens from Sparta. They may have you know two weeks or 10 days on the ground waging war against Athens or Athenian uh, you know villages, and then they would have to march back to Sparta to make sure those helots didn't uprise. And they would do this in rotating units so that there was always, Sparta always had a, a presence in, in the Attica, which is where Athens, the countryside of Athens, but never, they really had a divided army. They had to split their army. Some of it was security at home and some of it was to do force projection. Also, the Spartans had no navy. They lacked command of the sea. Um, and this was a weakness for Sparta. And the Peloponnesian League also was slow to act. It was, like I said earlier, it was kind of this, this old behemoth. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a honed organization that could you know, can move with lightning speed. It was slow, and this would give uh, Athens and the, and the Delian League strategic breathing room. He saw the nature of war would be fought and won at sea, and he thought that this would take, you know, maybe at the most three to four years to exhaust Sparta, because he knew that Spartans are stubborn. They don't give up easily. He thought that, you know, we could just hold them at bay, uh, for, and after three to four years, they'll get tired of fighting us and accept the inevitable that Athens is here to stay, um, but that this war would be expensive. This is not going to, you know, this is going to take a lot of uh, money and a lot of resources away from the Delian League, uh, which Athens really commanded. So Athens and the Delian League. So think again of the Delian League as an imperial democracy by this point in time. Uh, it has a unity of command through Athens. So it has like a hub and spokes decision making model. Um, but, you know, in truth, that many of Athens' allies, quote unquote, were ready to revolt. They were not much better than the helots. They would, um, any chance they got, they would, they would, they would, they might break away and there was a risk of defection. And I think Pericles knew that. The centers of gravity for Athens were this. Athens had unmatched wealth that, and that the not just the Athenians, but all their sort of, we'll say, colonies paid them tributes uh, or contributed forces. So they did have um, a lot of resources, both in wealth and military. They they were they had naval superiority, three hundred warships, and what Sparta was to land war, they were to sea war. They were trained, they were organized, they were good, and they needed just like Great Power Britain, they needed to have naval superiority to to maintain trade routes with the Delian League to maintain uh, command and command and control. So that, that's why they became a sea power. They evolved into a sea power. They also had good allies, again, wealthy military. They had 30,000 troops. Um, and then they had the Athenian walls. Now, 
this was a big deal back then, and there was a there was a uh, the sort of the first Peloponnesian War that took place in the I think that four you know around four forty four fifty kind of centered around these walls. Now, what is a wall? Who cares, right? It's just a wall. Well, this wall was particularly amazing because it was a huge defensive strategic weapon. And think about that. There are defensive weapons, defensive by nature, but they can upset the balance of power. Just like when the U.S. puts Patriot missiles in Taiwan, um, China sees that as a threat, even though it's a, it's a, Patriot missiles are an inherently a defensive weapon. Same with these walls. These walls connected the port of Piraeus, which was the Athenian busy and bustling port, with the city of Athens on the hill. And, and these walls were big, and they were pretty impregnable. Why did these walls matter? It means that Athens was siege-proof. And remember, siege warfare, even though it's the, Sun Tzu would say, the least effective form of war, it's of Sun Tzu's hierarchy of strategies, it's number four, the worst, but effective. It was very common. Uh, in the ancient world, it was common in the Middle Ages. And arguably, it's common uh, up, up, up until recently. Is it common in the future? We can discuss that. But what this meant, as long as, as Athens had uh, a commercial empire and naval superiority, they will never go hungry because they can import grain from anywhere in the Mediterranean, from Egypt, from Sicily, from anywhere. And they did. And that means you could not starve Athens into submission. You could, you know, if you took out their navy, you could do that, but Sparta doesn't have a navy. The Peloponnesian League's navy, like Corinth has a navy, but it's no match for Athens, right? So that's why these walls were a threat. And as long as Athens had these walls, it could be pretty belligerent. It would have sort of what we call a moral hazard in policy making. Meaning, well, it could, it could, it could, it could, it's like moral hazard is like owning, renting a car versus owning one. If you rent a car, you don't really take care of it as much. You can drive over train tracks full speed. You can drive over curves. You don't really care. It's not your car. Uh, if you own a car, then you're you're not going to drive over train tracks. You're, you're going to look at oil changes, etc. And so the, these walls, in some similar way, allowed Athens to be a lot more bellicose and aggressive than they otherwise might. And Sparta wanted those walls down. They'd wanted those walls down for 25 years. So Athens' strategy was this at the, at the beginning of the war. We want to compel Sparta to accept Athens as an equal. Our ways, under Pericles, it'll be sort of Maoist. We're going to have limited defensive war. They're going to protract the conflict. Hopefully, uh, Sparta will give up after three to four years. They're going to deny Spartan battle. They're going to retreat behind their walls. So Athens is like an island. They're going to maintain naval superiority. If Spartans erect forts, to retaliate because you can't afford to have Spartans create uh, like a, a, a toehold in the Attica, which is, again, the countryside around Athens. Uh, resist the temptation to extend the empire. So let's we're not going to extend Athenian rule. We're just going to hold tight. And we're going to keep the Delian League strong, which is pure Cotillia, and we're going to work through our allies, and we're going to frustrate Sparta until there's peace. That's Mao. Their means, wealth, allies, navy, and walls. That's their means, okay? This is the Pericles strategy at the beginning of the war. All right, let's go to Sparta. Sparta. So this is the Spartan king, one of them, uh, Archidamus, who is, I think, a pretty wise and good king. So he asks initially that the, the exact question that Clausewitz asks, says we should all ask, what's the nature of the war going to be um, or the warfare? You know, if we can neither defeat them at sea nor take away their, them their resources on which their navy depends, we shall do ourselves more harm than good. So he thinks this is going to be a long war that will be left to the children, and he votes against it, and he is overruled. He sees this war for what it will become, a little bit of a spoiler alert, and because he's a wise old man, I guess, um, and he is overruled by the Spartan uh, assembly. 
So again, it shows you how it's not an oligarchy. Kings with absolute rules do, acting as tyrants. A war party is sent out um, from Sparta to Athens to do a, a strategic assessment, at least an operational art assessment, and they come back thinking, oh, this will be an easy war. It'll, the, the, there's no way that Athens can withstand a fight against Spartans. We'll draw them out of the walls. We'll defeat them in battle. It'll be over. This will be, we'll be home by Christmas, just like 1914. So their strategic assessment um, is this, uh, this is of all Athenians, is that we are not, the Athenians are not like us. They are effete poets and philosophers, and they're not tough. They think they're tough, but they're not tough. They're really untested. Uh, we ourselves, we maintain our, our whole culture and our whole strategic culture is, is the opposite of them. Um, they are extremely wealthy. They have a superior navy. Uh, they can import by sea if we devastate Attica. So those walls again. They know that that, that Athens was pre siege proof. Um, this would be a problem. They had more allies who pay them money, who pay Athens money, and that you know they know that what they have to do is strip them of their allies. Sparta needs to strip them of the Del Delian League, and they think that'd be easy to do if only they had ships to get there. But they don't. They have some ships, but they be, you know, they know that as soon as this war begins, that Athens will do an embargo and a blockade on Sparta. There's no way they can they can break that blockade. So they really. The, 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 you know, causing disruption within the Delian League is out of range for them. They also, so again, what's the nature of the war going to be? The Clause 15 question. The king says it'll be protracted and bloody, and he said, let's not do it. But the war party said this will be short and easy. Victory is assured. They have a lot of confirmation bias going on. And that's what won the day. The war parties, you know, oh, it'll be easy. It'll be, we finally get to put Athens in a box strategically. Why would we be fools not to take this opportunity? So let's look at Sparta and the Peloponnesian League. So this is Sparta's, I like to call, democratic oligarchy. You know, again, the king's power is checked. So the Peloponnesian League is a loose confederation with Sparta as the leader, but not, you know, they, they move slow. They, they're not an absolute leader the way that they don't have a hub and spokes type of arrangement the way the Delian League does. And they also know that the Helots want to revolt in, in Western uh, Peloponnese. They also know that their center, the uh, uh, sorry, Spartan center of gravity is that they are a major land power. They have more troops than anybody, and they have the best troops. You know, quantity and quality favor them. And that Corinth has the third biggest fleet after Athens and Corsaira, which is allied to Athens. So they, they do have ships, um, but not enough to, you know, to, have, uh, to, to do what they want to achieve. And they have their strategic culture. Right, which is the you know come back you know either come with back on the shield or with the shield or on it. So their ends again are to liberate Greece from the Athenian menace, and there's some reason for that. I mean, Athens it set itself as a democracy, but it was really quite imperial, and its members of the Delian League wanted to break away. They felt they were sort of entrapped, colonialized. Many of them did. So here's the ways uh, under uh, Archidamian, even though he was voted down, he comes up with a strategy. He says, OK, I didn't win that, you know, I didn't win that round, but here's how we do it. So we have to keep our allies happy uh, by confronting the Athenians and rage hegemonic. So this is armed politics, right? Sometimes you do things in war. Not because they are the right arm things to do, because they are, they're the right political things to do. And Germany hated this. Remember, he says like these political uh, limited objective points for alliance maintenance is like the worst, you know, the worst way, the worst way to have a decision point. Um, but, you know, Germany wasn't a strategic thinker. Uh, Archimedean was. Uh, uh, he knew that if we didn't do something with Athens, that Corinth and others would would get antsy and that Sparta would would may lose its title as the you know as, as being cowards frankly in, in the Peloponnesian League which was a vice to them so they they were going to assault Attica they were going to do a, uh, a, a you know a, a slash and burn campaign uh, we're gonna we can't destroy anything in the walls but we can we'll destroy everything beyond the walls 
And if they are, you know, hopefully we can draw the Athenians out of the walls and defeat them in battle in a sort of a Clausewitzian Germanian logic. Who knows if they had psyops there taunting the Athenians, calling them, you know, weak poets and infantile playwrights. And, you know, who knows if they were, what they were doing to try to taunt them out of the walls. Um, they were also going to undermine the Delian League as much as possible by encouraging support and encouraging rivals and encouraging revolts. And they were going to seek assistance. They needed to build a navy. They knew that. So they can confront Athens at sea, especially from Persia. Um, so they were going to go to Persia and, and seek help there. But remember, what they when the first time Persia came to them, well, maybe the second time, they actually did. The Persians sent an emissary, I think it was um, for the Second Persian War, saying to Sparta, like, look, join the Persians. It's inevitable the Persians are going to win. We'd like to have you fighting with us. And we'll make you sort of the leader of all these lands. Um, and and then it, literally the Spartans threw the emissaries down the well, just like the movie 300. It wasn't as big a well, but they did throw them down the well. That was their answer. So here are the, here are the means. Uh, army, Sparta, the Spartan will, and the allies. That's what Sparta has to work with. Now let's do a strategic analysis. So let's do the war itself. And before we do that, this is called a shield wall. Uh, it's interlocking shields as a unit pushes forward. It has been a central element of tactical warfare from antiquity, like Sparta, until shields became obsolete in modernity. The Romans were very good at this too, learning much from the Spartans. All right. Now, like World War I, the Peloponnesian War was a total war for contemporary Greeks. It was a death match. Um, the Peloponnesian War, which lasted 27 years, um, it, it grew from what they, what they thought would be limited wars into total wars of devastation. It has three stages. Um, that he breaks up, we'll call them the Archidamian War, which is this uh, na named after the Spartan king, whose name I keep on mispronouncing. Then there's a break of peace, and then there's the Sicilian expedition. This is where Athens goes to conquer Sicily. We'll talk about what they were doing there and why. And finally, at the end of the war, the Declian War, sometimes called the Ionian War. So let's start with the um, Archidamian War. And this is the first sort of 10 years or 11 years of war. And this does not last, this war, as you can tell, it's not quick and easy, as the Spartans assumed it would, and it doesn't last a lot longer than three to four years, as Pericles expected it would. Athens refuses decisive battle to the Spartans, and as, you know, and, and so they don't, and so they don't quit, as the Spartans had planned to happen. And Sparta sends war parties to Attica, but Athens does not, you know, capitulate, as planned. So it shows you that your enemy has a vote in whatever strategic campaign plan you make um, or any operational art campaign you make. Um, both the strategies underestimated the what the enemy would do. And, as, and also, Sparta wanted to strip Athens of, Ath of, of allies, but it couldn't because it had no navy. Athens wanted to encourage helots to revolt, but it couldn't because it could not sustain the revolts. So, like, Athens put up these uh, sort of, like, fires, but they couldn't stay around to, to, to keep the, the fires go burn, and, and Sparta would come and put the fires out. Now, there was an exception to this later on in the war. Um at a place, at two places called Pylos and Spacteria, which shocked the entire Greek world because here later on in the war, um, Athens landed an, a, sort of an army there. Sparta sent an army, and the Athens were quaking in their sandals because nobody had defeated a Spartan army before, and they kicked butt. They kicked the decisive, two decisive land winds against the Spartan army, which shook Sparta shook Athens and shook the Greek world. Spartans never lose. And here's an Athenian army on the back, you know, backyard of Sparta. And the Athenians beat the Spartan army not just once, but twice decisively. And in, in I think uh, 20, 424 BC. Yet this still it was not enough. This resulted in a strategic stalemate. Um, why? Some there's multiple reasons, uh, but some people 
many people point to this question of uh, the the you know sea power versus land power. They have a means mismatch with the other. Their primary weapon systems can't <laughs> it can't destroy the other, uh, and they're fighting a mostly military campaign. So they have a whale versus elephant problem. You know how can you achieve decisive battlefield victory if you're if neither weapon can graze the other? You can't. Clausewitz in Germany would have been frustrated. And again, this is mostly a military war by this point. It's a, uh, the, the character of warfare is very Clausewitzian, very Germanian. Also, second is that the Spartans just don't give up. They're not, they're, they're Spartans. Mao would also be frustrated. So what breaks the stalemate? Strategic surprise. The plague, for one. So remember Athens' magnificent walls? They backfired. Long war had produced poor hygiene and cramped conditions as refugees from Attica flooded into Athens to take shelter behind these walls. And, um, and once, uh, we don't know if it was typhoid or something else, but once a disease, in this case, it was traced back to grain shipments from Egypt, came into Piraeus, the plague set off and exploded like a wildfire. Like people were dying. Pericles died. His sons died. I mean, I don't know if it's 25% of the population, but it was devastating. Um, And, uh, you know, according the Spartans, you know, so it, it spread quickly and it was devastating. The Spartans also were exhausted. Uh, both sides exhausted each other. Um, according to Thucydides, quote, the Spartans finding that their allies would not listen to them, dismissed the representatives and proceeded to form an alliance with Athens. This is what Clausewitz would call chance in war, perhaps the unexpected, and it leads to the peace of Nicias in 421. Now, Athens and Sparta agreed to a peace that would last 50 years, commonly referred to the Peace of Nicias. The, he's an Athenian who had probably more to do with this than anybody else in terms of making it happen. Who was Nicias? He was a central figure in Athens at the time. He was pretty stodgy, not flamboyant, and less has spoken of him than his contemporaries, perhaps, but he was more responsible than anyone uh, for the course of events at the end of the war, and I think you could argue he navigated them pretty well. Um, both sides had sort of basically, they're like two boxers who just couldn't stand up anymore. They're both exhausted. But there were problems. In, um, in, in the Peloponnesian League, the Spartans were exhausted, and then they really saw no fruit to this. The king was right. But the other their allies were, they were furious. Corinth, Thebes, Elis, and Megara refused to sign the peace treaty. According to Thucydides, there was peace as far as those who had accepted the terms were concerned. But Corinth and various other cities in the Peloponnese were trying to upset the agreement, and Sparta found itself immediately in fresh trouble with its allies. Also, Sparta itself began nibbling away at Athens' sphere of influence. For example, Sparta won the Battle of Manatinia against Argos, uh, an old enemy, which we'll talk about. Um, but it had been pressing on and, and neutrals that had aligned themselves somewhat with Athens, and this was this was you know testing the limits of this pre, of this peace deal. But it wasn't just the Peloponnese League that who wanted more war. There was actually a war party in Athens too, and it was led by a very charismatic young man called uh, Alcibiades. Alcibiades. Um, he was good looking, rich, a member of the elite, a protege of Pericles, ambitious and wholly unscrupulous. He was notorious for his flamboyant lifestyle, his loose morale. He was like a bad frat boy. Um, Never short of enemies or admirers, including his teacher Socrates, um, a fat that was brought up against Socrates in his trial. So he led the, uh, the Hawks party. And they, too, wanted more war. Uh, They tried to reorient Athenian foreign policy back towards a confrontation with Sparta. Why did they want more war? This is the reason he gave. And it's a reason has been used throughout history. Uh, 
And it's a reason I want you to think about because uh, we see scoundrels use it and we see wise people use it. Where's the, where's the link? It's the age-old strategic logic of preventative war preventative warfare and it's in its cotillion grand strategy basically if we sit you no know, if we are on top of the world today but if we sit still somebody will replace us so if we don't go out and conquer we ourselves may be conquered and we've heard this again in our you know some version of it in um the iraq the u.s's justification to going to iraq in 2003 um, how many wars in history have been started with this strategic logic? And what do you think of that? Is that a red flag for you? Or is that sound strategic wisdom? And in what context would it be either? <clears throat> the only So he says the only way to really stop Spartan aggression and eventual dominance, argues Al, uh, Alcibiades, is to go and prepare for war. The fight was far from over. And just as a war warning, I will keep on mispronouncing uh, Alsa Beades. I will keep on pronouncing his name, so please bear with me. So um, Alsa Beades, uh, his weapon, though, was cunning diplomacy. Think of him as Catilia. Um, he advocated dramatic shifts in the alliances and the renewal of Athenian imperial growth. Remember, Pericles said we must refrain from imperial growth. It's a resource suck. Um, this, in his view, though, and I'll say Abedi's view, was the only way to assure Athens could defeat Sparta the next time the two states class, which he thought was inevitable. So perhaps we should call it the Alcibiades trap rather than the Thucydides trap. But he had one problem. How can they start a war without looking like the aggressor? This is strategic thinking, armed politics. We see Lincoln confronted with this in the beginning of the Civil War. You have to wage not just an armed campaign, but a political campaign well. And it looks better if you're responding to somebody else's offensive act rather than you starting the fight. And you need this sympathy, you need this legitimacy to maintain alliances. War at the strategic level is armed politics. You can't just be a military general. You've got to be a politician as well. And they were. So their answer was, <clears throat> there was to sabotage peace in a cunning way. Again, think Catilia. They ally Sparta Oh, that's right. They ally Athens with old Spartan enemies who, with, who have hair trigger fingers, um, hair triggers, such as Argos. So remember, we talked about how Argos is the holdout in the Peloponnesian the Peloponnese. They were the, the sort of the hegemon of the Greek world uh, a century or two earlier until they were defeated and taken over by Sparta. They weren't taken over, but until they were defeated by Sparta, they've never left that goal go. And they were like, hell no, we're not parting. You're not, we're not part of a Spartan's Pel Peloponnesian League. We're fiercely independent. And Sparta and Argos have been at each other's throats for a long time. So, at, so the war party was like, well, we'll just align with them and then we'll try to set off a war between them and then we will have to come in as a, for our defensive pact on the side of Argos and that will suck in Athens into a war with Sparta and that will reignite the Peloponnesian War. Hooray, right? So that is what they do. Um, and this is, this is what happens. Argos and Sparta do go to war in this interwar year and Sparta does come in and does kill, I mean, sorry, Athens does come in on in defense of Argos, its ally, does kill Sparta. And the Spartans are like, what the heck? What are you doing? You're breaking the peace. And, um, and Athens has this, this famous defense or, or quote unquote defense. We're saying, well, no, we're not, we're not attacking you, Sparta. We're just defending Arginians. We're not attacking you, our enemy. We're just defending our allies. Um, and the Warhawk party are, are you know, like gleefully, you know, chuckling in the background of, of the assembly. Um, and, but then Sparta backs down. Sparta's like, oh, we don't really want to do this war again. And that leaves the war party going, what the heck? What's going on? What do we have to do to pull this 
superpower, this warlike superpower of Sparta into a fight. Come on. They're like a bunch of chicken pansies. So, um, so frustrated, they set their sights on a new scheme. They get Athens to invade another, well, they get to invade a neutral, Melos. Remember Melos? This is an island. It, it's kind of too far away uh, and a little too big to be pushed around by either power, but they're not a great power. Um, so he says, well, we can't, you know, Sparta's not going to invade Melos, but we can invade Melos. So they convince um, Athens to say, you know, we need those resources. We need to expand our empire. Um, we need the timber for a fleet. Uh, we need, you know, people. So we're going to go invade Melos. And they do. They land up. They have an army there, they, but they land a, 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 a sort of a peace treaty, quote unquote, party on Melos. And they encourage them to join Athens against Sparta or else. And this is the famed Melian dialogue, because the Melians are like, well, we don't really want a part of your war. And then the, the Athenians said, well, you know, the, the strong do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must. Um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the Melians, as you know, famously said, well, screw you, get off our island. And so then the, Ath the Athenians invade take it over, kill the oligarchy, emplace their own people, and it becomes yet another sort of vassal state to the Delian League. And the war party thought, for, well, for sure, this will um, this will draw Sparta out because now we're, we're upsetting the balance of power. And certainly if they don't do anything, it's going to look bad for Sparta. It'll look bad for Sparta in front of its own allies like Corinth. So certainly Sparta will go to war and break the peace, and it looks like they broke the peace at this point. Um, and so they're all the the war hawk party is all super happy about this. And then the Spartans back down again. And so the and there's so the war party is like, what the you know, ah, oh, these these are just wimpy people. And then Alcibiades comes up with a new scheme, bigger, better, bolder. What is it? The Sicilian expedition, 414 to 413. Now, what is it? So Sicily, as you know, was the other major hub of power in, in the Greek world. Now, they were not part of the war, but this is where there's a huge concentration of policies and super witch policies as well, many with ties to uh, family ties to the Peloponnese. But again, these were not colonies. They were sort of like offspring, and they weren't too tight with uh, with with Sparta or Corinth. And they and they had loads of wealth and loads of people, loads of timber for building a fleet, loads of grain for feeding an entire empire or league. And a chief amongst these was Syracuse. This was, you know, if what Sparta was to the Peloponnese, when Athens was the Aegean, Syracuse was to Sicily. And they had, again, bloodlines to Sparta. Uh, and so the idea was a bold move of war to do war by surprise as much as you can back then uh, and and sail the entire Athenian fleet and army uh, into Syracuse take over Syracuse and then we own Italy I mean sorry we own Sicily not Italy Italy had barbarians and Conan so we we own Syracuse um, and that was the plan and the war and and this of course was hotly debated Many in Athens, probably like many of you, are thinking, WTF, why would you do that? That's a Hail Mary pass. You're going to put everything on a super long campaign into a foreign place that you really maybe don't have enough recon. And you're also leaving us at home kind of vulnerable in case Sparta hits us again. Um, but the Warhawks said, no, we have our walls. We should take a chance. Fortune favors the bold. Um, and if we sit still, we will become conquered. If we sit still, the opportunity cost is strategic, you know, is that eventually we're on the glide slope to defeat. So let's let's make a bold move. And the assembly debates this and debates this. It's captured in um, Thucydides. And eventually the what the democracy comes up with is maybe the worst of all decisions. It's sort of a yes, no. Um, and so what they do is they put the man who is in in charge of uh, the man who was in charge of making the case for Sicily, which is Alcibiades, and the man who was opposing him, as uh, as they are co-leaders, 
They are co-leaders. And, you know, this is his name. Um, and so this is Nicias versus, versus Alcibiades, arch rivals, and they're to co-lead it. Now, is that smart to have two leaders who have completely diverging opinions? And, you know, Nicias now has to you know, help lead this this armada which he fought everything tooth and nail to 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 not have so now he's stuck with it and so it's that good now and then something happens that's kind of weird uh at least weird to the modern mind so the night or two nights before the sh the fleet is about to leave and go sailing onto sicily which is a, a long voyage there is a scandal there is something there things got crazy right before the 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 hermai these this is called hermai and this is very popular these are statues with the head of the god of hermes and a large erect phallus uh such things were fairly common in antiquity uh christianity and others later stamped these type of this these ideas out this type of art out and it and and this was seen you know so many people going around with hammers knocking them off seen as extremely bad luck on the eve of this big armada and many uh and and many thought alkiabates and his crew or his revelers were responsible because they had done similar things in the past remember he has a bad boy image uh and sailors are a superstitious lot back then as they are today and many are like we can't go to we can't sail today we can't sail. with to postpone this whole thing but you can't just postpone huge invasion forces as you know there's logistical timelines admin headaches and so they they sail away um, with you know this sort of cloud metaphorically over the fleet. Um, then the 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 Athenian justice court uh, says, you know what? I you know two weeks later they find Alcibiades guilty, and they find his party is guilty. So they send their fastest ship out to chase down the slow fleet, and they capture Alcibiades and his ship. And it says, you are arrested. You must come with us and stand trial. And Alcibiades knew this was a death sentence. So he got away somehow, and, and he, he got into another boat. And we don't know, there's no Hollywood action scene showing this, but he sailed to Sparta. And he defected to the Spartans, right? Uh, and he t told Sparta the entire plan. And the Spartans sent their fastest ship from Sparta to Syracuse to tell the Syracusians, which have blood ties, the entire plan. And and also Alcibiades says, this is how you beat the Athenians. So he, so he uh, Alcibiades completely turns treasonous. And, um, and you know, not, not surprising, you know what happens next. It became a strategic disaster for Athens. They walk right into the trap. So um, they in Athens, the uh, in Syracuse, excuse me, the Syracuse the Syracusians utterly decimate the entire fleet and the entire army of Athens. And uh, this ruined Athens because remember this is like Athens Hail Mary strategic pass. They bet they bet their entire almost the entire armed forces on this ploy and they gambled it and they lost. Their military was destroyed. Their, now their treasure was bankrupt. The, the strategic leadership in Athens has gone awry. I remember Nicias, who was against this whole thing to begin with, had to fight it, and he died. Uh, and you know, um, and the Delian League now sees weakness in the Athenian armor, and they start to revolt. And in fact, there's a coup d'état um, in in Athens democracy, and demagoguery replaces democracy in Athens in 411. And then as soon as that happened. The Persians, who have been waiting in the wings for a long time, they've been waiting to see both sides eat each other up, erode each other. And their plan all along was to come in on the winning side, but just enough to, to keep them all eroding each other. They're letting the Greeks kill each other so that it's, a, it's literally an easy walk, walk in the park, if you will, um, for the Persian Empire. And so... This marks the beginning of the end for, for Athens. It is what Clausewitz calls the culminating point of victory for the Spartans. It's the day the war is over, but not the day the war is 
oh, is, well, it's a day that the war is won, but not the day the war is finished. Because nothing that Athens can do at this point can get them back on top. Everything, they, it's, it's a, the point of diminishing returns. It's inevitable they will lose. The question is, what year will that happen? And so this is the culminating point of victory for the Spartans, or, you know, the culminating point of defeat for the Athens. And it's important to recognize as a strategist because this may influence your ends, ways, and means. And just so as an epitaph for the, Ath the Athenians, the Athenian POWs spent the rest of their days digging in quarries in Syracuse. And you can still go there today. So this is just <clears throat> on the outskirts of, of ancient Syracuse. And this is where they died, digging this hole in the ground. Um, so that's what happens to POWs in antiquity. All right, so no, Athens is ruined, but not dead. Athens is ruined, but not dead. We now enter the last phase of the war, sometimes called the Declian War or the Ionian War, mostly because that's where the fighting occurred. On the advice from Alcibiades, again, who was, had, you know, is now sitting in Sparta, telling them how to beat his former polis that he claimed to love and lead, um, they... The uh, it was a you know Sparta set up defense systems. Uh, it fortified a garrison town in Declia here. It's a small like city or village. The reason it was strategically important is that it guarded vital trade routes from northern Attica from Athens into the north. Because remember now, Athens does no longer has. Um, naval superiority. They had lost the, the bulk of their fleet in Sicily, and Persia has now joined the fight, and guess what Persia brings? A fleet. So no longer are they siege-proof. So Athens requires money, wealth, you know, timber, grain from the north, and now that's cut off too because Sparta now occupies the, the the sort of the mountain passes that go from the north supply supply routes all the way into Athens. So that makes it a strategic hold uh, or uh, on or yeah, at least an operational art hold for Sparta on Athens. Also, the Ionian coast. This is where uh, going back, you know, the 12th century, etc. This is where Greeks had settled. Um, during, you know, the, from Troy on to the Peloponnesian War. And there's a lot of Greek polisi there. And they had broken away from the Delian League as soon as Athens showed it, you know, it's, it had crested as a power. But suddenly Persia is now focusing in on this war and they're getting really nervous. So they then say, okay, the Delian League's a good, good thing again. So they switch sides. They join Athens yet again and say, if you lead us, we will follow. It's going to be, you know, it'll be more in our terms, but, you know, Persia is now in the mix. So for those who live on, you know, arguably Persian soil, they're getting super nervous. Um, so Corinth and Syracuse also are slow to act. So we're asking ourselves, like, why is this last phase of the war, the culminating point has been has been reached. So why does it still take, you know, nearly 10 years, 11 years for Athens to die, if you will? And another reason is because Corinth and Syracuse are slow to get their fleets into uh, the Aegean and... Again, the Ionians uh, are now part of the Delian League against the Persian Empire. And this is the important part, is that the, the Athenian or the Delian League fleet is still a force to behold. It is no longer decisive like the old Athenian fleet, but Athens kept 100 ships in reserve. They now have the, the, the attention and the resources of the Delian League. And guess who it's led by? Yes, that's right, Alcibiades. So Alcibiades, after he got caught sleeping with the king's wife, fled Sparta and defected back to Athens, and they put him in charge of leading the fleet. And apparently he did a pretty good job. Um, so they they achieved critical victories uh, at you know places like Sisychus against the Spartan fleet. Uh, and also uh, near the Straits, Ismith. Um, but And also importantly is that Alcibiades and the fleet 
did not recognize the coup d'etat that happened in Athens in 411. And this coup d'etat, just so you know, it was because uh, many Athenians felt like democracy had failed them. And they replaced it with uh, a committee of executive strategic leadership who could make this, you know, decisive actions in war, who could think strategically and not come up with these uh, silly strategies to go to Sicily led by demagogues like Alcibiades. And but then this this sort of like the council of like it was 40, it was 40 men. Um, quickly became demagogues. And they were actually relatives of Plato, and Plato was invited to join them in 411, but he was, but he said, no, thank you, I'm really just a scholar. Um, he talks about this later on in his life, uh, right before he's died, he's like 70 years old. He talks about in letters about this period of time, which is very interesting for those who want to know about the Athenian um, coup d'etat. Um, but with the, since the Athenian coup, coup makers couldn't get the fleet to obey them, they were kind of hobbled. They really didn't have much, pol- you know, in terms of armed politics, they had no, they had the politics, but no armed. And Alcibiades and the fleet became their own sort of roving political armed politics, if you will, um, until they got finally defeated by the combined forces um, of Sparta and Persia at the Battle of Egos. Uh, sorry, Agos Potami. Uh, and it was led actually by a skillful P- Spartan general called Lysander. There are many Lysanders in Spartan history. And it was the end of Athens as a power in antiquity in 404 AD. I'm sorry, 404 BCE. But it was also a pyrrhic victory for Sparta too. Because it was too weak to stand. I mean, Persia, again, was dragging its feet because it was hoping that Sparta and Athens and the other policies would basically eat themselves to death, eat themselves up uh, to the maximum extent possible. So Persia was also very slow to act. Uh, and eventually, um, the, the Greeks did that. Uh, the Persian strategy of wait and see and draw it out kind of worked as well. Both superpowers essentially took themselves out, meaning Athens and Sparta, leaving Greece broken and dysfunctional. I mean, Spartan leadership proved more oppressive than most Greek city-states had experienced under Athens, uh, and now are suddenly nostalgic for Athenian, uh, you know, imperial democracy. Greece defended uh, its, you know, found itself into further descended into further turmoil, and wars broke out uh, between other city states until eventually, King Philip II of Macedonia in the north swept down into Greece and sort of took it wholesale because it was so weak, and he's the father of Alexander the Great, and that was at about three thirty eight. A.D. And then came the Romans, and the rest is history, as they say. So the Peloponnesian War forever ended Greece's golden age. And, you know, the Peloponnesian War is more than a case study of strategy. It is a 2,300-year-old moral tale of human aspirations, of insecurities, of power and hubris. Warfare has changed, but humans have not, making this a cautionary lesson for those who might have entered war casually, as at least as some of these powers seem to have done, as we still do today, perhaps. The Greeks' decision shaped the world that followed and even shapes our world today. This is what history is. Decisions made by one one generation that irrevocably impact decisions of future generations. And so the wheel turns. The best we can do is learn from our past. So in conclusion, I want you to think about these brain teasers. Who really won and why? I want you to assess Spartan and Athenians, their assessments of each other's, uh, what was the critical thinking quality, and the resultant strategies that stem from them. Were ends, ways, means balanced? Were they feasible? Were they acceptable to their societies and allies? And was there strategic adaptation, at least enough? What could you do? What would the theorists have advised? Also, the Peloponnesian War was not one war, really, but many, with interspersed you know, periods of war and peace. Yet Thucydides kind of lumps them together into a single 27-year conflict. Is this valid? Does, you know, does World War I and World War II make more sense as a single war? Other wars, too. So should we get beyond thinking about war or peace, but some version of war and peace? 
And also, as the war went on, Athenian democracy hardened and finally became an autocracy. Does this case tell us something universal about democracies in war, especially ones that protract? And do you believe in the so-called Thucydides trap? Uh, many people do. You know, uh, Thucydides writes that war was inevitable and was caused by the growth of Athenian power and the fear this caused in Sparta. But is war inevitable between rising powers and ruling ones? Are there counterexamples in history? And can the Thucydides trap really be a trap of our own critical thinking? You can learn more about these strategic ideas in my book, The New Rules of War. Uh, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to email me. This is my personal email address, inquire at seanmcfate.com, and my, my website, uh, www.seanmcfate.com. Um, this is Dr. Sean McFate. Um, I hope you've enjoyed today's case study and that you learned something from it, that war is, even though it's 200 years old, still has much to teach us.